Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I think we have a, a very interesting, well, as usual, we have a very interesting gospel reading today, given to us for our consideration. I think the image that you can see up on the projector from a movie that's a favourite of mine, one many of you will be familiar with. So I've got a little bit of a quiz for you. Can anyone make the movie and what's happening in the scene? So it's not uh, the, the um, Monty Python crowd, is it? There you go, there you go. The um, Reverend John has picked the movie. It is indeed Monty Python's Life of Brian. And it's the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> so you might not realise that today's gospel actually comes from the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it's the middle bit. The beginning of the sermon will be very, very familiar to you because it's heard at weddings. It's one of the most famous parts of the New Testament. And of course... The Sermon on the Mount is um, a part of the, probably the greatest sermon ever given in the world. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I think we can agree that those are nine statements that serve to upset our complacency, to shift the world. They're a little bit radical, a little bit surprising when we think on them and pray on them. And then today's gospel reading follows directly on from those nine blessings. Firstly, Jesus describes his disciples as the salt of the earth. In the ancient Near East, where these events transpired, salt is actually associated with wisdom. So perhaps we could say that Jesus is uh, describing his followers as wise, as deeply rooted, as anchored into the ground, into tradition. Secondly, Jesus describes his disciples as the light of the world. His disciples are called upon, as we are called upon, to be a visible sign of what is to come. A sign that should not be hidden, but which should be displayed prominently for all to see. And finally, Jesus instructs his disciples that they are to obey the law and the prophets. Jesus states that he does not come to abolish these, but instead to fulfil them. And I think that's an instruction that maybe should cause all of us 21st century Christians to pause for a moment. It's worth saying it again. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfil. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. The law and the prophets, what today we would collect together and label the Old Testament, or perhaps we can refer to as the Hebrew Bible. As you may know, this year our weekly readings focus upon the Gospel of St. Matthew. Every Gospel is a distinct book. It was written at a, each Gospel is written at a particular time, by particular people, in a, in a particular place, and perhaps even originally with a particular audience in mind. We all know that Jesus was a Jewish man living amongst other Jewish people, but perhaps it might surprise some of you to realise that Matthew's Gospel can be considered not a Christian book, but a Jewish book. A book written by a community of Jewish followers of Jesus, originally for an audience of Jewish people, as well as for people who were called God-fearers, Gentiles who participated in Jewish worship but had not fully converted to that faith. Four decades after Jesus' earthly ministry, the people of Judea rose up against the Romans in what is now called the Jewish War. And this revolution was put down with overwhelming military force by the Romans. 
The second temple, that great and holy place, which had been the centre of Judaism, was destroyed. And in the wake of that war, the Jewish people were scattered. And in the aftermath, a question arose for Judaism. What now? How should Judaism continue in the world after that calamity? Scholars believe that Matthew's Gospel, the Gospel we're focusing on this year, originated in the city of Antioch, which is in Syria. I believe there's still a, a town there. And the, 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 it originated about 15 years after the Jewish War. So not long after, it would have been uh, an event much in the memory of the people in, in that city. Antioch was a major centre of Roman power. In fact, it was actually the place where the Romans amassed the troops uh, that then invaded and pacified and conquered Judea. And there in Antioch, there was a small population of Jewish worshippers, some of whom were followers of Jesus. And that group of people came to have a particular understanding of Jesus, a distinctive understanding which we can find in the Gospel of Matthew. An understanding of Jesus in common with all of the other Gospels as the incarnate Son of God. But also, perhaps distinctively, as a new Moses, a person whose ministry belonged in the great Jewish prophetic tradition. In that tradition which has always spoken uh, quite boldly for justice, reflecting on the events occurring around it. Uh, a tradition which we see well represented in today's readings from the prophet Isaiah and also to, in today's psalm. And so that community of people came to see Jesus as a person sent as the final and correct arbiter and interpreter of the law and the prophets. And we can see echoes of Moses in the Sermon on the Mount. As Moses presented the law to Israel from the mountaintop, so in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus actually interprets the law, again from a mountaintop. In the verses which follows today's Gospel, which we'll be reading next week, Jesus interprets the law, perhaps making it more intense. So when we consider this time, about the year 85, um, so five, maybe six decades after the death and resurrection of Jesus, but also about 15 years after a calamitous war, that time that we're considering um, today uh, was the source, perhaps, of two great world religions. The first of them I don't think will surprise us. The book of Acts tells us that it was in Antioch that the uh, first followers of Jesus came to be known distinctively as Christians. And the second religion that perhaps came out at that time is rabbinical Judaism, which um, we might consider to be our sister faith. And that faith is of course alive and well in the world today. So what are we all to do with this? And why am I feeling called to share it with you? Well, this week I went along to a preacher's day <coughs> out at Wollaston Theological College. And that's a, a day where they get people from all over the diocese that preach, um, priests, bishops, uh, peasants like me. And <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> and then we talked quite frankly about, uh, we talked quite frankly about the realities uh, present in Matthew's Gospel. And uh, its role, its reception, its um, impact throughout history. And it's not universally positive. We know the history of the relationship between Christianity and Judaism is full of error, of terrible conflict. And unfortunately, there's actually quite a lot in Matthew's Gospel that has fueled Christian persecution of Jewish people down through the centuries. Indeed, it's in Matthew's Gospel where there's particular blame um, apparently attached to the Jewish people, uh, not just to religious leaders in Jerusalem, but to all of the Jewish people, indeed, down through the ages until now, apparently, uh, for the death of Jesus. It's known as the blood curse, and it's actually a, a very, very um, startling and shocking uh, part of Matthew's Gospel. And it's difficult, I think, for us to understand. 
Unfortunately, plays based on the trial of Jesus, uh, as it's depicted in Matthew's Gospel, uh, have been frequently performed through medieval times, all the way through uh, up until, and this is a little bit shocking, 1930s Germany. They were actually encouraged, these performances, by the Nazi authorities. And as unpleasant as it is, corrupted understandings of this text actually played some role in enabling the Holocaust. And yet, as I pointed out earlier, maybe a little bit in quite a strange contrast, Matthew's Gospel was written by people who considered themselves to be Jewish. People who certainly were in conflict with other Jewish worshippers. People who did not share their understanding of Jesus as the Messiah. And that conflict that occurred in Antioch is a conflict that we see reflected in the Gospel. And it's a conflict that we, unfortunately, can see has gotten further conflict down through time, down through the centuries. And yet, Jesus calls on us, the Christian church, on each of us as his disciples, to be the salt of the earth, to be grounded in wisdom, to be grounded in the tradition and wisdom that we find in the Old Testament. Just as the, um, the followers of Jesus, the disciples of Jesus in Antioch, prayed for discernment, struggling to understand the nature of Jesus, coming to their own unique view of the nature of Jesus, their risen Lord, I think so we do the same 2,000 years later. And as they drew on the law and the prophets to understand Jesus and to understand how to live their lives, building up the kingdom of God as they went, so may we. And so also I think we can draw on a new innovation in the Christian world, one that's only about 150 years old, and that's biblical scholarship. Biblical scholars like the um, uh, um, learned academics at Murdoch University can provide us with background and history and context which let us understand our holy texts at a deeper level. So I want to finish off by going back to those two beautiful metaphors at the start of today's gospel. Salt and light. Perhaps wisdom and hope. And I think as I look around this church, I, well, I know that as I look around this church, I see both of those things in great and wonderful abundance. A constant and unfailing reminder of our God. A God who is active in the world, a God who seeks to bring all people together. A God who helps us as we build up together the kingdom of God. The Lord be with you. And also with you.